Welcome back to O9H. This is Zane Gilmore, and that's Ben Warren. He'll talk later. It's going to be very exciting because they're going to switch. And let's welcome them to have a good talk. Hey, uh, g'day. Um, I'm, I'm Zane Gilmore, as was said before, and Ben Warren's going to be helping us out. Um, and today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, how we use um, open source software in our scientific um, uh, things that we do in plant and food. But first of all, we, I'll talk about who plant and food is, and uh, what you know what we do and why. And um, we'll go through some examples, etc. So um, we're a Crown Research Institute. Uh, the Crown is the government. And um, there are the uh, most of the others. I don't. I think there might be another one which is not co that doesn't quite call itself a Crown Research Institute, the Cawthron Institute or something. But uh, there's uh, uh, Ag Research, ESR, Scion, GNS, Lanky Research. Uh, Ag Research does animal stuff. Um, ESR does. Uh, they're like CSI for New Zealand. Um, Scion is the forestry people, GNS are the geologists, Landcare Research are the ecologists, and Niwa are the weather people, and we do plant and food. Um, we, are, as I said, Crown, we had a revenue of about $120 million last year, which is small bickies for even some of the uh, likes of Red Hat and Google, but uh, we're a research institute. Um, um, we, we're supposed to earn half of our revenue from private stuff um, and uh, there are some of the, about a thousand odd people and three, three, um, two thirds of which are actual scientists and research people, uh, two equivalent programmers, I'm the only full time program in the IT department and uh, that's where we are in New Zealand, and there's a couple of places. We've got a couple of sites in Aussie and one in Davis, California. So what do we do? Um, we do research on, well, plants and food, which is fairly obvious. Um, we... We help with we do breeding for things like um, kiwi fruit, apples, peas, potatoes, strawberries. Um, so and we make money from um, creating new cultivars of all these things. Um, and we also uh, help farmers uh, farm their crops more efficiently and all the rest of it. We try to find cures for diseases and insect problems. Um, and we also do research with food, nutritional health, um, things like gut health for people, you know, and if you eat a kiwi fruit, how does it improve your gut health and things like that. Um, and uh, we do nutrient analysis, which I'll be talking about later, and we also help food manufacturers um, do their thing better. Um, we also inherited the seafood and fishing um, stuff. Um, so uh, we've got a, a few people in Nielsen, we, and just recently there was um, uh, a big thing on TV about how these guys had developed a new fishing net, <laughs> um, which let all the big ones out and all the small ones out and just kept the middle-sized fish. So the idea being that you, you try to preserve the fishery. Um, so it was all kind of cool. Um, there's other things that we do. Electro spinning is the one that springs to mind. But even that is uh, electro spinning is where the nanofibers they sort of extrude out this, you know, couple of nanometer fibers onto a charge plate and all that sort of thing. They make um, acoustic tiles and things with it. But even then, they're using proteins made from wheat and all that sort of thing. So it's sort of in our wheelhouse. <laughs> um, so that's what PFR does. Um, at, a, 
as a research institute doing biology, we're, we're striking some problems. We're finding that um, as the technology gets better and better for scientists to do science, the amount of data that they produce is going up faster than Moore's law. Um, when the original human genome project was done and it was, it was finished about 2003, it had cost about $2.7 billion to, to sequence the first genome. Um, within, uh, what was it, about 11 years, it's now costing around about $5,000 to um, sequence the human genome. The, the, um, the, the amount of money it costs to sequence a genome has just plummeted, and that grey line there is the Moore's Law line. So there's no way IT can keep up with the amount of data that's being produced by the new technologies that are coming up. So um, scientists are finding that if they want, they've got all this flash new equipment, <laughs> and then they um, they say, oh, I want to store it on the shared drives at work or whatever, and um, they just, we don't have a hope of, you know, they're producing terabytes and terabytes, starting to, you know, hit, um, large proportions of petabytes, and we just don't have the means to actually store the data that they're producing. So that's becoming a problem for us. But uh, it's, it's not just that, it's not just the storage of the uh, data, it's also the processing of the data. Uh, scientists, like a soil scientist, that would have a trial, some trial plots out in the field somewhere and he'd go out every day and take his, the readings from whatever he was doing. Um, now he can set up these data loggers that, will, that can take a reading every minute. So the amount of data that they are producing has gone up by many orders of magnitude. Um, and um, they uh, have storage problems, but they also have the, their ability to be able to process the data means they, they can't use Excel anymore to do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, I, I, just recently I had a, a young scientist, she, she was working on one of these projects with data loggers, <laughs> and um, the, she had been taking, uh, the, there was, a, this piece of equipment was producing a line of CSV data every minute, and in, this was around about November, and it had been taking one every minute since April. <laughs> And so there are about two or three hundred thousand lines of data in the file. It was a CSV file, and she tried to put it into Excel, and it brought her machine to its knees. And um, so all of a sudden, she had to learn how to do. I went and put it all into a Postgres database, and she had to learn how to. Well, she had to learn what SQL was for a start. And also, um, so she got a bit of help from some of the um, the old fellas that uh, could do R and Python and all that sort of thing. So in the end, um, they managed to get some good stuff going there, but uh, it was touch and go there for a while. Um, open source is obviously helping there. So R, R is, a, is a statistical programming language, which in the this forum here, not... People have sort of heard about and heard that it was a crappy language, but it's actually quite a good language for scientists doing statistics. And there's lots of good tools around R and all that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, there's Python and Perl. Bioinformaticians love Perl, <laughs> but um, <laughs> the, the um, Python is sort of rising in pro. Um, prominence nowadays. So, yeah, got the um, drinking from the fire hose is definitely one of the problems that they're having, the amount of data these guys are producing. Um, they just, they can't process it fast enough a lot of the time. Um, okay. Okay. A big part of what makes science tick is what we call reproducible research. Science, a scientific paper describes what a scientist does to produce a certain result, and 
um, the uh, so when somebody reads it, they say, "Oh, that looks really interesting result. Let's see if I can re- do the same thing and reproduce the result." And when you're putting huge amounts of data through lots and lots of complex data manipulation stuff, you need to keep track of what exactly what you've done. And so IPython is the bomb for this sort of thing. Um, I've got scientists who just love and they just sing the praises of IPython um, to a huge degree here. This is um, a a screenshot from what we call the rain shelter, which is a trial where they've got, you know, a thing with about you know, it was a 20 by 30 metre plot which they can roll a great big roof over the top of when it starts raining. Um, and, but uh, they they track soil water capacity and they measure amounts of water going on and how long it takes to evaporate and given this much amount of sunlight and all that sort of things so, and then they're graphing it. These guys are only taking samples every quarter of an hour but they've... There's about 10 times the amount of data that they're taking every quarter of an hour. Um, So, yeah, iPython, wonderful piece of technology which our people love. Okay. Being able to open source um, what we work work on can sometimes be a problem because... In uh, we're a a primarily a biological research institute, and biologists, as a general rule, are not good computer people. Um, Geneticists are. Genetics and computers have gone together since the start of computing. Genetics can't happen without computers. Biology, not so much. A plant physiologist or a food food scientist or a um, entomologist, entomologist just needs a microscope and a piece of paper and they're away. But, um, and so it's only recently that computers have even become useful to them in any significant way. So all the old fellas that have all the, the, the control, the checkbooks at a research institute are all these old biologists who never really used computers during their early career. And so, um, they the, when, when I go and talk them into spending a few hundred grand on developing a piece of software and say, now I want to GPL it, they say, you want to give it away? And so I have to, there's, a, there's sort of battles I have to fight at every step of the way along there. Um, however, they are scientists, and scientists do listen to data, and they're supposed to be intelligent, it's sort of sp- supposed to be part of the job spec for being a scientist. They're supposed to be intelligent, and they do respect data as a general rule. So we're making progress. I'll be telling you about an application I've been working on, and I've got another potential client for that particular application here in the room. <laughs> and uh, the um, and I'm hopefully going to be GPLing that, hopefully soonish. Um, yeah, the CRI funding model is a is a bit of a problem because we only we only get sort of fifty percent of our um, funding from the government. Okay. Nutritional analysis is a, a big part of my job. Um, I look after the New Zealand Food Composition Database. Um, we track over 2,600 foods. So if you want to know how much fructose there is in a kiwi fruit or how much um, polyunsaturated fatty acids there are in a steak or whatever, um, we, we do the analysis and we, now we publish the results in, uh, in the, the URL, www.foodcomposition.co.nz. Anybody in the world is allowed to download that uh, that particular data set. Um, we've got uh, it's good data. Um, it's uh, it's got uh, we track over three hundred 
nutrients and foods um, for in, in some of the data sets. But, I mean, that's like 120 different fatty acids and every one of them are named. And um, so there's all the, po- the polyunsaturated fatty acids and the monounsaturated and the del- delta... Uh, delta... Uh, what was it? The uh, delta, delta 3 fatty acids? Uh, oh, I can't remember anyway. Um, but they're all, all, the, all of the... All of them, uh, there's about a dozen sugars, and but um, there are there are shortened things which are actually useful to the to most of us, um, and you can. Uh, so if anybody wants to write a really cool app with that data, go for it. It's really good. It's quite a good good data set. Trouble is that um, we right now we're using SQL Server to store it. Um, I've I've been given the okay to rebuild it, but we're still in the in the process of uh, of going through all that. Everything happens uh, in a uh, over long time periods at a uh, biological research institute. Um, and uh, yes, we we produce th- um, these data sets for the Ministry of Health. They give us lots of money to do it, um, and uh, they. So yeah, they they're giving us most of the money to do that. The Ministry of Health um, and the Food Safety Authority, to a certain extent. Um, yes, we've been given the go ahead to. I'll be doing it in Django and Postgres stack. Hopefully, um, we'll be doing that in the next little while. Just to give you an idea of the complexity of the system because I'm looking for somebody to help me build it. <laughs> um, we've got, there's an attribute calculator and the recipe calculator. These are two calculation engines in, in FCDB. Um, an attribute, the attribute calculator calculates attributes within a food. So the example of that is how much energy a food has, and it will look at about a, over a hundred other different attributes to calculate how many attrib- uh, how much energy there is in food. All of the fatty acids, all of the sugars, um, organic acids, alcohol, you'd be amazed at how much energy there is in alcohol. Um, and, yeah, so, so there's, and, and so that this thing's got all, you put in all your formulae for calculating things like re- um, energy and things like poofers and moofers. A poofer is a polyunsaturated fatty acid and a moofer is a monounsaturated fatty acid. Um, so all that sort of thing. And then we've got recipe calculators because we've got foods in there which are just defined by their recipes. So that, um, and we have to calculate what we call the nutrient line of a food um, from its constituent ingredients. And when you apply a cooking process to the um, to the recipe, then it changes things like vitamin C is destroyed by heating and things like that. So it gets real complicated doing all that stuff. With they're, they're called uh, retention factors, and it's really expensive data to get. And we um, thank the American food um, food uh, FDA. I think they produce a lot of that data, um, and. Um, then there are recipes of recipes, and a good example of that is the is a meat pie. So um, a meat pie has meat stew as a filling, and it has it's surrounded by pastry. So we've got a, a recipe for the pastry, and a recipe for the meat stew, and then you do your calculations for the for those parts there, and then you put it together, and then you bake it. And that's how we calculate how much there is of, you know, how much vitamin C there is in a meat pie. I hesitate to get very little, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> there'd be a little bit from the onions and the meat stew probably, but it wouldn't. Not much would not much would survive. I wouldn't think. Um, the and, and so yeah, the, the it gets really complicated really fast, and it takes. Right now we do a full recalculation every night and it takes five hours. Um, and yeah, it should be able to do it faster than that and that's why I'm rebuilding it. Um, but uh, yeah, we're looking for some people that can actually do that complex stuff. 
Uh, moving right along. How much time have we got here? Um, we also do uh, plant breeding. And um, a good example of the sort of scale that we do for plant breeding, there's about 5,000 odd little seedlings there. And uh, they're, they're actually trying to breed a red fleshed apple in this particular case. Don't ask the obvious question, which is why, but that's what they're doing. And uh, so these are all thousands of seedlings with different crosses, and they are taking one tiny little piece of leaf off each seedling, putting them into test tubes, and then putting them through a laboratory looking for particular genetic markers. And in this particular case, it's the genetic marker that produces the red flesh because they found it. The people like Ben, who's going to talk to you later, they sussed out which bit of the genome says that it's going to be a red-fleshed apple, and they go and look for it, and any seedling that doesn't have it is killed. <laughs> um, and uh, it means that we don't have to bring hundreds of, well, thousands of seedlings up to the point where it can produce a, a fruit. So... Um, to do that, you can't do that with pen and paper, so we built a, um, we built a uh, database application called Kia. It's not, a, uh, it's not an acron acronym, it's a, uh, just named after the bird. Um, and it does that for the scientists. They can, they, they can get their printouts and things and they can go out into the, into the glass houses and collect their leaf samples and go through the laboratory processes and then when they finally get their results back they can then say that seedling dies and um or that one lives so that's really that's what we do a lot of we do a lot of killing of plants um but we're very careful about which ones we kill <laughs> um so that that's uh that's kia i'm I'm hoping to have it open sourced. I'm told that it, if, if there is any New Zealand organisation that wants to use it, they can have access to it because it's paid for mostly by the government. But um, I would like to see it open, properly open sourced, um, and uh, hopefully I'm gonna, that's going to happen in the near future. Um, it's, it's a Django application against Postgres, um, and we're running Elasticsearch. Um, indexes on it too. The, uh, we're getting up to over a quarter of a million samples in there, and it's yeah, the the scale of it's starting to get a little bit silly because there's yeah, just thousands of thousands of rows linking to thousands of rows linking to thousands of rows. It starts to get a little bit silly. Um, yes, that's Kia. Um, the other stuff that we were working on, I was telling you about the rain shelter, that's a picture of it there. Uh, it's about, what's that, about 20 metres across there, and um, that's all barley plants and wheat plants and things like that, and they've got sprinklers, which they measure exactly how much water goes onto it, and they've got radiation meters measuring how much sunlight each plant is getting, and then when it starts to rain, that thing there is actually on rails, and it just rolls over the whole top and keeps the rain off. It's an awe-inspiring sight, and uh, when it was built in the 80s, apparently, it was a lot of money. That thing there is a lysimeter. It's a bit lower, same sort of thing, but smaller scale, and those are half-buried buckets where they measure how much water they sprinkle on, and they also have a mixture of... Um, they have some artificial urine that they also sprinkle on to see what that does as well. and So it's all very, uh, well, odd sometimes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, th these, got, these guys are sampling every minute and these guys are sampling every quarter of an hour. But these, well, these guys, are, uh, um, they've got 1,600 sensors in there and they're sampling every quarter of an hour. These guys have got 160 sensors since every minute so the, the the data is getting really big that there is a picture of an old mass spectrometer and those guys are spitting out data at a larger amount all the time as well um 
And, and basically, I'm getting a request from a, a scientist every week for some sort of database to try to track what they're doing. Um, and so, yeah, I, I spend a lot of my time saying no to scientists. It's a bit of a shame, really. Um, but uh, now it's time to... Um, Ben's going to tell you a little bit about uh, genetic science. Bioinformatics, in fact. Thank you, Zane. Yeah, as Zane said, I'm, uh, my name is Ben. I'm in the plant and food research bioinformatics team, but I also do quite a bit of uh, software um, engineering on the side. Um, so we, we don't make half dog, half birds. Um, maybe Zane thinks that's what I do. He made this slide. Um, but thanks for the pretty pictures of DNA, which is what these are. So moving along, um, I'm going to talk a little bit... Whoop, I'm going to talk a little bit about the genetic science and why we use floss for genetic science. So in the bioinformatics team, we do omics. So there's uh, quite a few different species of omics. Mainly we are doing genomics and transcriptomics, which are the study of DNA and RNA, respectively. So give you a bit of a background on this. Um, DNA is a double-stranded molecule. It is the genetic code that we all hear about in the papers. Um, RNA is what's made from DNA. So RNA, uh, DNA is like a template. RNA is perhaps an instance of a template. So there's molecules and cells which know which bits of this to take to make into this. And then there's other molecules which take this template and turn it into a protein, which is a functional unit, which will actually do something. So we need to know which bits of this make the bits of this we're interested in, like making the apples red. So one of the problems is we need to assemble the genome first, because the uh, sequencing technologies, uh, well, the Second generation sequencing technology shear up the genome into many small pieces. So an analogy would be um, given in of the same textbooks, possibly different editions, so maybe just slightly different, maybe quite different. Cut them all into strips, put them in a pile like you see here, and um, reconstruct the original texts. Now, if you've only got a, a small book, that's quite doable, but the human genome is three point something gigabases for memory. I don't know human genome very well. Um, but plant genomes are often three, six fold larger than that. So this becomes quite a big computational problem. It's, I mean, it's huge for the human genome, so it's huger for plants. So we need compute power. So one of the, one of the main things we need uh, software for is computation. So we have what's called OpenLava, which is an open source job scheduler. Um, we use this to assign jobs to appropriate nodes and priority queues. Um, this allows us to utilize our cluster to the most efficient way. We also uh, have PowerPlant, which is something we developed in-house, um, with most of the credit going to Eric, our systems administrator, who's in the audience. Um, and this is basically our compute cluster. It's a shared data store of around one petabyte. Uh, we have visual compute nodes and physical compute nodes, some of which have up to two terabytes of memory available for these algorithms that require a lot of, a lot of data to be stored in the memory for them to run efficiently. We need software for visualization, and this is really for the scientists. Visual, represent, visual representations of data, um, well, they enhance our understanding of the data, and we also see things in different ways and get new ideas. So uh, Ensemble allows us to visualize genomic data quite well. This is um, written in Perl. It's a joint project from the Sanger Institute in the UK and uh, EMBL and EBI in Europe. And 
It can uh, incorporate user data very easily, which is important for us to have users to be able to put their own data on without needing to come to the bioinformatics team. And extendable and customizable uh, options, which means we can add our own plugins, our own um, analysis pipelines, and also share those back with the Ensemble community. So here's a, a a, a screenshot of Ensemble showing us the wine grape genome. And uh, we see in a th three different magnifications here, we have top level is the whole of chromosome seven of wine grape. That little square here in red is represented here in this next level. And these are uh, showing the functional genes that have been identified in wine grape. This is the detail view. And here we have those functional genes again. Well, some of them, it's just from this small square here, blows up to this. And here we have single changes in nucleotides, which are the A's, C's, G's, and T's of DNA. And this gives us a control over fine grain resolution of what we want to view and is easily shareable. So that's really good for our scientists to collaborate. We also need software for reproducible research. Um, Zane mentioned this earlier. Reproducible research is necessary for science to work. So we use work, we call a workflow a recipe for describing how to get from your input data all the way to your results with all the steps in between what software you used, the versions of the software you used, and also, or probably most importantly, why. Your intent is just as important as what you did. A well-documented workflow allows this process to be reproduced exactly. This is important for transparency. The scientific community wants to know how you did stuff. Verification for the same reason. And sanity, so you can remember what you did and how you did it. Because when six months go by and you have to do it again, it makes it easy if you know exactly what you did. So we use a a program called MOA, which was developed by an ex-PFR employee, Mark Fears. Um, it allows uh, extendable templates based on common workflows. And this quote from Mark, he says, MOA hopes to make meticulous organization of a command line project much less of a burden, leaving you to focus on the fun parts. So we like the fun parts, so we like MOA. Um, it integrates with Git which is awesome. We can uh, version control our workflows. It integrates with Open Lava. We can send jobs to the cluster without having to worry about which nodes we're sending them to. It does it for us. So reproducible research is assisted even further by Git. Git, I mean, everybody knows Git's awesome. But <laughs> we use Git to store our workflows. And we use it to template workflows, and we branch them to make instances of a workflow for a particular project. And that allows us to uh, remember exactly what we did for every project we ran a workflow on and be able to go back to it. And GitHub allows us to share this for collaboration on a national and international level. We need software for scientists. Scientists, uh, as Zane mentioned, some of them are a little bit slower on the uptake of computing. So they don't tend to like the command line. They like GUIs. So um, a GUI command line tool, Galaxy, uh, GUI 2 command line tools, Galaxy, is what we use. Uh, we provide this for scientists in the power plant application service. Um, it gives you a history of everything you've done, which helps again with the reproducibility. Um, it, this allows you to construct workflows from your history. You can run the workflows that you've constructed with fresh data. It integrates with the job schedulers again, so we don't have to worry about where to run these things. Um, per user management allows fair controlled use of disk space and uh, it has extendable tool suites, which is probably the most important point because we can write our own plugins, wrap up any command tools or scripts we want into this uh, GUI framework, which allows the scientists to use it without having to plug away at the command line and accidentally do something they didn't intend to do. So an example of Galaxy we have here, um, 
This is uh, quality checking of probably one of these input datas here. I'm not sure which one it's showing. Um, and this is a box and whisker plot of the basically what we call the quality of a read at every point, which is basically how well the software thinks the machine read the A, C, G, or T. How accurate was that base call? Was it really an A or was it not? And the quality drops off quite badly at the end of these reads here, which is actually typical for uh, this type of sequencing. We also have here is the history. So this is all the input data. These are the quality control checks. I've done some trimming of the data. And oops, I've pressed a button. And over here, we have all the tools available in the Galaxy suite currently. So that makes it quite nice for, for, scientists, to, for scientists to use. So why floss? Um, there's quite a lot of reasons we like free, libre, open source software in science and in plant and food. Um, first reason being open or openness. Um, it's a similar philosophy to scientific research, or at least I believe it should be. Um, scientists like to share, they like to be open, they like to see what the others are doing and that enables the verification and the other things I talked about earlier. Um, it's current, it keeps up with the scientific community. Part of this is because the scientific community is the other people writing the software half of the time. Um, the other reason is it's, uh, you know, it doesn't take so long to get things going, get things moving and get things updated as it does in the closed source communities. Community and collaboration and knowledge sharing are a big part of science and also open source, so this fits very well. It's flexible. We can adapt it to our own related, slightly different problems because we have the source code, we can see what's being done, and we can fix little bits up, we can switch things around to make it work how we want it to work, and then we can uh, push these changes or new functionality back to the community and see how if how they can make use of it as well. And I think, again, the last point is the most important, trust. I've heard this a lot this week. Don't trust what you can't read. And scientists certainly do not trust what they cannot read or understand. You can't give them a black box and expect them to use those results in a publication if they don't know how they came about. So I've recently been asked, how does DEseq work, which is an R package, which controls differential, well, calculates differential expression between genes. Um, it was easy to find out. The documentation was actually quite good. So that was a good start. Um, they, it showed the statistical calculations done at every step. We were able to verify that the results were what we thought they should be and that they were using the correct statistical methods to get there. So this helps us evaluate our science as well. So that's why we love floss at Plant and Food. Here are my references. If you're more interested in any of the softwares I have talked about today, um, or please just come and have a chat with me or Zane. So I'd like to ask if there are any questions. Hi, Zane. Um, have you considered using compression for the data logging? You're saying you're, you're running out of space, but uh, maybe compression is an option. I, I assume the, the data is reasonably easily compressible. Oh yeah, the um, the the data logger stuff is very compressible, and that goes down. But that sort of just buys us sort of a couple of years, really. <laughs> uh, um, the, the, this, the 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 volume is going up logarithmically, and um, compression you can sort of get will get you only so far. Um, so it's only going to give us sort of like a couple of rounds of Moore's law, really. Um, so, yes, we are. There's 
places where we are doing compression. Of course, it gets a bit funky when, I mean, you can compress a genome down real small, but when you're trying to do search as blasts and all those strange things that the genetic scientists do, um, they have to be able to read that compressed data other, and then it just adds more um, time and things. More CPU yeah. is used. But at the moment, storage is much more expensive than CPU for us, so compression is still a valid technique. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Zane, you mentioned that you often have to say no to scientists. Is that because of not enough developer time, or is that because you've got not insufficient storage or compute? Sorry, can you repeat that, please? You said you often have to say no to the scientists, to the requests for the scientists. Yeah. Because you don't have enough time, or is it because you don't have enough um, storage or compute? Oh, all of the above. Um, the um, yeah, there's only one of me really. Well, there's there's a, another couple of. Uh, part-timers in the IT department that do a bit of pr uh, development as well. Um, and, um, but, uh, yeah, the, yeah, it just comes down to this, yeah, I, I, I can't clone myself really, and that's the problem. It takes a lot of time and effort to produce another application, and, yeah, it's, it's a real shame. It'd be nice to have a few minions. If, yeah. y if you were a plant, we could clone you. Yeah, yeah. But you're not. <laughs> yeah. Um, in Australia, we've got exactly the same problem where, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty common to science in general, and I'm really interested in any techniques you've found to actually convince scientists of the value of open source specifically as opposed to just whatever tools you happen to be giving them. Um, I think that a big chunk of it is metaphorically... <laughs> nailing their feet to the floor and then actually explaining it to them. <laughs> um, the big thing is that, as I said before, scientists, I mean, the ethos of science is the data. And so when you actually, produce, when you actually present them with the facts and explain everything it, from first principles, they usually get it. Um, there are a few exceptions. But in my experience, scientists usually are, do listen to reason. Um, un, I mean, unlike a manager. <laughs> but um, the, scientists are scientists. They, they have to respect the data, otherwise they're not a blooming scientist. Yeah, um, yeah, that's sort of what it comes down to. That's been my experience. You sort of sit down and try and... Often you do have to explain things from first principles, though. You can't assume all of the knowledge of most of us in this room who know all about the arguments for Floss and why, and even Moglin and Richard Stallman and all those people, the, 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 all that knowledge is assumed for most of us. But um, a, a entomologist or a plant physiologist hasn't got a clue. <laughs> well, that's not always the case. I'm generalising and stereotyping madly here, but that is... Yeah. <laughs> yep. You've got a lot of infrastructure on the premises. Um, what, what's stopping you offloading this to Nessie or, or AWS for the storage side of things? We're actually looking at um, options of uh, working with Nessie in the future. Um, yep. I'm not actually sure on the details of that. That's all I really know. Um, yeah, you have that, to give me some money, though. <laughs> our, our main issue is really um, portability. So moving data from us to Nessie and back and forth is actually like the huge amounts of data um, that need to be shuffled around is, from my point of view, probably the biggest issue between us using, say, Amazon. Yeah, it's just the sheer volume of data, again, trying to move data from one place to another. I mean, it, to move these things it, can be overcome, but... Yeah, yeah. they can. But to, to move a petabot of data from one city to another, you probably need a forklift and an 18-wheeler truck is probably the fastest way of doing it. Yeah. You'd have to yeah. be a very fast network, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, eh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, does it work? <laughs> Yeah, okay. Oh, are you from Rienz, eh? <laughs> ah, right. <laughs> cool. Come and talk to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, over here. Uh, 
it sounds when you're talking about the difficulty of releasing code that you write is open source it, it sounded like you're having to have the same argument over and over again with different managers is there not like a institute or like ministry wide policy on that sort of thing <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question jeez <laughs> um, uh, no different different branches of science um, have different people who write checkbooks, that, you know, sign the checks. It's, yeah. But yes, as a general rule, yeah, once you've got a precedent, yeah. Anyway, I think we've just run out of run out of time. Um, yeah. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, so on behalf of the team at LCA and all of the attendees, um, we would like to present you with a small gift. Just as a thank you, you can thank share you. between the two of you. And I think that's all. Thank Another you. huge round of applause for these guys. Thank you.